Hello and welcome to Global Business, CCTV's new program with insights into Africa's ever-changing business landscape. From Nairobi to Johannesburg, from Lagos to Cairo, from small businesses to large-scale corporates, we take you directly to entrepreneurs making the headlines. I'm G2 Abraham here in the Kenyan capital of Nairobi where it's 9 p.m. It's 2 p.m. in Washington, D.C. and 2 a.m. in Beijing. Wherever you're joining us from, welcome. Anxiety in Egypt heightens as the central bank hikes interest rates for the second time this year. And American investors eye Africa ahead of next month's U.S. Africa Leadership Forum. And an enterprising young boat owner in Lamu, Kenya, tells us how the tourism industry has changed his life. We begin with an update on Malaysia Airlines crash in Ukraine. Reports say international investigators have arrived at the crash site of flight MH17 after rebels in eastern Ukraine allowed them access. Now, some 30 monitors went to the village of Grabovo, where the plane carrying 298 people came down on Thursday. The two sides in Ukraine's civil conflict have accused each other of shooting the jet down with its missile. The UN Security Council has held an emergency meeting calling for a full and independent inquiry. The Boeing 777 was flying from Amsterdam to Kuala Lumpur. Latest figures released by Malaysia Airlines show the plane was carrying at least 189 Dutch nationals, 27 Australians, 44 Malaysians, 12 Indonesians and 9 Britons. We shall continue to bring you the latest updates on this developing story. Egypt's central bank raises uh, interest rates and ha the benchmark interest rate for the country. Uh, this is in a bid to hold inflation just two weeks after the government slashed subsidies on fuel and electricity. The central bank raised the overnight deposit rate to 9.25 percent and the lending rate to 10.25 percent. According to the bank, the hike is necessary to be able to tame inflation in order to limit a generalized price increase of goods. Egypt's economy has been battered by more than three years of political turmoil since the 2011 unrest that drove foreign investors and tourists away. In order to restore the economy, the new president, Abdel Fattel al-Sisi, slashed subsidies on bread and fuel to balance the country's current account deficit. Despite billions of dollars in aid from Gulf allies in the past year, Egypt's economic recovery has been sluggish. Growth forecast for this year ranged from between 2 and 2.5%. Joining us now live from Cairo, Yasser Hakim. He's here to help dig a little deeper into Sisi's economic plan for the country. Uh, Yasser, Sisi seems determined to fix Egypt's economy. First, he introduced a stock market tax. Then he cut fuel and electricity subsidies. And now the central bank has raised its interest rates. Uh, what are reactions there to this? The reactions, well, uh, investors were surprised um, because when you increase uh, interest rates on loans, then obviously you are hindering uh, more investments uh, and loans for investments. But what he's trying to do, which is favorable maybe to the normal citizen, is that first he's trying to curb inflation and inflationary prices that uh, have resulted from the slash on subsidies, especially oil, uh, energy subsidies and fuel, as well as he was trying to uh, control uh, the Egyptian pound from weakening or devaluation because of the uh, inflationary policies. And in this case, when you increase the uh, interest rates on, on bank accounts, then you expect that more Egyptians will save Egyptian money rather than change into hard currency uh, as, as another safe option for investment uh, and keep the Egyptian money intact. The, uh, the deposits have reached a, a, a quite a record number of 1.3 trillion Egyptian pounds uh, in the Egyptian banks and it's already increased by another 200 uh, billion Egyptian pounds in the first quarter and the government wants to keep this uh, as it is balanced without weakening the Egyptian pound and keeping it as it is in front of the US dollar. Has the influx of money from Gulf countries to Egypt helped to improve investor sentiment? Yes, uh, we, we got statements from, from various ambassadors and, and businessmen from, from Canada, from Italy, from uh, the U.S., the biggest investor in Egypt, and they all said that they will increase investments in the next few months rather than decrease. 
uh, as well as China, uh, the ambassador met with the uh, Minister of Investment and he said that China is planning more investments in the country. But the biggest investments are the Arabs. The Arabs are still going hard. The Gulf Arabs, especially United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. And they are investing a lot in the infrastructure, mega projects and the real estate. Those are the main two uh, projects uh, or sectors that they're investing at. And they're also planning to go into the tourism industry as well. All right, thank you for that. That's Yasser Hakim joining us live from Cairo. Now, Meridian Africa Airlines Limited Trading as Uganda Air is set to lay off over 200 staff after it suspended its operations in Uganda. The airline says the cut was brought about by its inability to generate any revenues after most of its fleets were grounded. Air Uganda has been out of operation for the month after International Civil Aviation Organization withdrew its certificate of operation. Leon Sesenege has the details. Out of the skies and now out of business. Air Uganda, a local private airline, has announced an indefinite suspension of its operations. A month ago, the country's state run aviation agency revoked the airline's air operator certificate over safety concerns. There were other options uh, to have a smooth transition. Um, and if those options were really not there, uh, then there should have been a very speedy response to make sure that uh, we work towards the restoration of normality as quickly as possible. The situation as it is now, it means we have closed the entire aviation system for Ugandan registered airlines. As the country's leading local passenger airline, Air Uganda has been in operation for the past seven years, operating daily return flights to South Sudan, Tanzania, Kenya and Somalia. While recertification is slow, the prolonged period of grounding has affected major contracts of the airline. And now over 200 staff could lose their jobs. At the moment, uh, we are working out mechanisms for how we manage ourselves during this period when we have an extended uh, period where we are not selling uh, any tickets and we are on ground. Um, so the staff obviously cannot be coming to work and not doing anything. It plays on our psyche. It's difficult to manage. Uh, so we, according to the board uh, decision, which is to suspend our operations, we necessarily have to send our staff away uh, until we can have a proper view of our long-term future regarding this problem. Air Uganda, a subsidiary of Meridian Airlines, says it has been paying the Ugandan government up to $15 million annually in revenues. And Ugandans are feeling the impact. The cost of travel around the region has more than doubled. Experts predict that foreign airlines will now monopolize Uganda's travel routes, making flights even more expensive. For now, it is not certain how soon or whether at all Air Uganda will be back in operation. Leon Sanyange, CCTV, Kampala. All right, looking now at the markets that we track here for you, let's focus on Ghana, which closed today 0.24% higher at 2,344.07 points. For some numbers news out of the country, Ghana cuts its 2014 economic growth target and forecasts a wider budget deficit and higher inflation. According to the finance minister's statements earlier in the week, this is being attributed to falling revenues, the slide of the SETI, and declining gold prices. Kenya's government finally sells its stake in wine marketers to a South African company. We bring you the details. And American investors eye Africa ahead of next month's U.S. Africa Leadership Forum. Africa is on the move. It's only seven of the world's ten fastest growing economy. From small businesses to large-scale enterprises, you're directly from entrepreneurs behind the story. It's about putting you in the picture so you know where Africa fits in the global context. Global Business, weekdays at this time on CCTV Africa. The rebasing of Nigeria's GDP has been a long time in coming. The information provides us much more scope to know what the, the structure of the economy is.
Welcome, you're watching Global Business. Now let's start back here in Kenya, where the country has agreed to sell 26% stake in its wines and spirits marketer to South African Distel Group for $9.81 million. The government owns 72.65% shareholdings in Qual. Though the Industrial and Commercial Development Corporation, the government is seeking a total exit from Qual over the next three years. The initial sale of 26% stake to Distel will be followed by a 4% stake to employees. The remaining 42.65% stake is to be offloaded over the next four years. Distel's brands include Armarula Liquors, Two Oceans Wines, and Savannah Cider. Distel is part of a group of South African companies looking to invest in fast-growing African industries in order to offset weak performances in their home country. With the U.S.-Africa Leadership Summit just a few weeks away, the U.S. is looking even closer at what it means to do business in Africa. The Initiative for Global Development, a nonprofit organization that aims to reduce poverty in Africa through business growth, has just appointed new president Dr. Mama Nedelkovic. Nedelkovic has over 40 years of experience and has worked in 51 of Africa's 54 countries, and he's passionate about the future of the organization. On today's What's Hot site, segment. He speaks to our Washington correspondent, Kate Fisher, on Africa's prospects. What do you see as the biggest challenges facing the continent? You look at the last five years, while well, everyone has been in effect in the doldrums economically worldwide, except some of the emerging markets, Africa has been booming. And so you really have a transformational economy going on continent-wide. Pockets of obvious problems, there's no question about it. Uh, and that, when you say that the challenges for business, is really identifying where are the proper beachheads, where are the best opportunities, where does one, particularly the new to market companies, where does one first begin to conduct business, in which country, in what region. So th those are the main challenges. One, selecting where. Two, then having selected where based on the market opportunity and, and and obviously the, the resource availability, is to be assured that that political stability stays. I mean, I've had an example of Mali, where we spent 10 years on a major agribusiness project, ready to launch it on an April and March, we end up with a coup d'etat. Literally, as we're launching a $600 million project. So that, you know, that sort of thing is, is unforeseen and, and the most difficult part for business, but you can't mitigate against something you don't know that's gonna pop up. So it's the uncertainty that is difficult. And you talked about um, choosing the right place to, to do business. W are there particular countries which are easier to do business in? Is, where, where would you say is really a shining example? Or are there places that are still not very easy to and, and need to do more, more work on that? The large countries with large markets, the Nigerias, the Ethiopias, the South Africas, and of course we're in all over Africa, so the Egypts and the North, you know, they're large enough markets that any sort of investments are interesting in and of the country itself. I'll come back to the countries. The smaller ones is where the critical issue comes forward on, on the regional markets <coughs> and the ability to move product and trade and flows across borders. Part of the problem is, you, is when you have the changes. I mean, Mali was a fabulous place. We operated for many years and then, boom, all of a sudden something hits. So leaving aside these sort of aberrations, if you will, we have seen now certainly in West Africa a long period of political stability with that one, one exception. In Liberia, Sierra Leone, that whole area has calmed down. Nigeria, I think, has a certain vision in terms of economic growth and, and investment. Now, they're having their elections coming up, so we'll see where that might go. Ghana, I think, has got some macro issues, but it certainly have big, big uh, economic uh, attractiveness to it. I mean, East Africa, very, very, very s more sophisticated. There's been, they've been longer, if you will, on this private sector kind of uh, approach with Ethiopia, Uganda, Kenya, and now Ethiopia very much coming into the scene. In Southern Africa, same. So, you know, it's, uh, what's nice in terms of the trend, the question asked 20 years ago, I could identify three or four places I'd want to do business. Now, as we go forward 20 years later, there's maybe three or four that I guess it's very difficult. I don't know how you, one would do business in Somalia or South Sudan these days, very difficult, or even Zimbabwe until certain changes. Given all that, what if any challenges still remain for the continent? The ports, okay? We're seeing improvements, it's opportunities, but there's still challenges. 
I think on the airlines and movement there, we're, we're, we're going in the right direction. I mean, obviously cell phones and, and that whole mobile communication is quite advanced. And in fact, <coughs> on a, one of our uh, areas of interest in, uh, in ICT and, and banking, I mean, we've seen in East Africa and in Kenya, and Equity Bank is one of our Frontier 100 members and leaders, is probably the most advanced mobile banking, you know, anywhere in the world. I mean, so it's, it's top notch, if you will. And just looking ahead to the US Africa Leaders Summit, do you have optimism for <coughs> that? Do you, what do you hope can be achieved? But it's the first time it's happened. That, well, your question, the end of your question is exactly probably the most important thing. It is the first time it's happened. So if nothing else happens, that has happened. I mean, we're looking forward to a very, very productive week. You're going to have the business leaders, you're going to have the political leaders, you will have civil society, the various NGOs. Um, I mean, the only danger is that it over, sort of overheats with too many things happening, which is you know, a danger in itself, clearly. But I'm very, very hopeful of the long-term results. The best we've had in the past in terms of attention, that has been the SAGOA, the Staff and Growth Opportunity Act, which is in itself important, but it's one element. You know, this is, I think, raising the bar in terms of that level of interest. And then, frankly, it's up to the two sides. You know, you've got the companies that need to continue the relationships they will be building up. And the political leadership is going to have to stand behind the various pronouncements they're going to be making. Let's look now at commodity prices for the day. Looking at Brent futures, which held above $107 a barrel as a sharp drop in the U.S. crude stockpile and promising economic growth data from China indicated an improved outlook for demand in the world's top two oil consumers. And when we return, an enterprising young boat owner in coastal city of Kenya's Lamu tells us how the tourism industry has changed his life. Welcome back. You're watching Global Business. Now, the Six BRIC Summit has seen the establishment of the New Development Bank. Reactions to this new financial institution have been generally positive. In South Africa, South in South Africa, Angela Coppola has been asking people their opinion about the bank's launch and its potential to make a difference in the lives of South Africans. While the political heads of the BRICS countries have signed the new development bank into being, the analysts are split in terms of their thoughts. As it stands, the proposal behind the BRICS bank is ambitious. The bank itself is modest by way of the initial capital it's going in. But make no mistake, this could have a material impact on the economic landscape in the fullness of time. I think if they're trying to duplicate the World Bank, perhaps I think the, the objectives are certainly driven by geopolitics, objectives may be noble, but we don't want to see an overly politicized uh, bureaucratic lending institution here. It's a challenge to US power. Um, it is not a blatant challenge. This is not a new currency or trying to, but it's the big, it's the steps in that direction. It's the, and, and I think in that sense, it's a geostrategically hostile environment to be doing it. The US is not going to be completely relaxed about this. There is another view because there are huge opportunities on the upside when it comes to infrastructure investing. We also have a very ambitious infrastructural spending program. We're talking about the best part of a trillion rand over the next 10 years. And there would certainly be scope uh, and capacity for something like the BRICS Bank to, to facilitate. I don't think that the feed-throughs for South Africa, the consequences that we are now taking away for money from somewhere where it could better have been spent, it's not that kind of money. Um, and I think that the upside for South Africa is huge. Will this bank, will the capital unlock um, sizable infrastructure projects that, projects that can result in scalable economic activity? I think the jury is certainly out. While the bank has seen the light of day, the devil is in the detail. And let's bear in mind that any banker is looking for a return on investment. And that's going to be the case with this bank. I'm Angelo Coppola for CCTV in Johannesburg. 
Moving now to the blue waters of the Indian Ocean, where we meet Ashraf Omar, or as he's better known, Captain I'll Be Back. Omar shares with us his secret to successfully running his boating company here in Kenya's picturesque Lamu Beach. When I was in a high school, I used to escape some classes. So sometime when I walk, I'm walking out of school, the head teacher of the school will ask me, where are you going? I'll say, I will go to the loo and I'll be back. So I escape for half of the day, I come to work because life at that time was very difficult. So I go to school half day and half day I go to find some jobs to do. So then he will go to the class and ask my classmate, where is I'll be back? So then my classmates started to call me, I'll be back, I'll be back. The name get outside in the village. So everybody is familiar with my name as I'll be back, Captain I'll be back. Well, I wake up early morning at five o'clock. I go for prayers and then I go running on the beach around six. And then I start my business at seven o'clock. So mostly I do transfers to Lamu people bringing people there for shopping or fishing or barbecue like this and picking people around noon time at the airport, bringing them to Shela or taking off, going back to Nairobi or somewhere else like this. And then I end up my day around six o'clock after work. Well, when I was young, I was really interested on the activities that are taking place on the Indian Ocean. So I've got an old man who is a very great captain here, who used to take me fishing at night time. So he taught me how to drive the boat by night time, how the movement of the current, the tide, the wind. So I found it uh, is uh, really interesting. That's why I get into the business to start my own business. I just look at the place, I saw there are many guests, many tourists, so to my thinking I say it's better I do something rather than just to stay idle. That's why I started my first boat by the name I'll Be Back and then I make another one called I'll Be Back Too. I got the third one, I'll Be Back Soon and the fourth one is called I'll Be Back For You. With this business, first when you wake up in the morning, you just concentrate like what you are always thinking, what you are going to do. Because it's very hard to tell how your day is going to be, because it's not something that you plan, this is, every day is like this. So the business, it will depend with the customers. So mostly your mind, you're concentrating with how the day is going to be. All my family members, I offer them a free ride, yeah? So, and they do appreciate because the income is taken to the family and uh, we all appreciate what I earn. Well, since I started the business, is like six years back. It was very good. Well, it's a marketable business. We used to earn big money. But just after the kidnap of the French woman, the business has gone down. If the government will put a very tight security, then the business will be better than before. If security is better, then is many tourists we are going to have at this area. Like uh, domestic tourism, we do have a lot of guests from Nairobi. They come to visit this place. But you find it is people who have been here 10 times or 30 times, so they are familiar with all the places. So if you're trying to talk to him, to take him somewhere, he's or, he has already been to that particular area. So our target is the Kenyan government to advertise Lamu or to advertise Kenya in general so that we can have uh, international tourism. <coughs> well, I'm making another one 
which is not yet finished, so the name will be On My Way. Looking now at how your money is trading. The South African Rand is down 0.77%, trading at 10.67 to the dollar. For some financial news out of the country, the Treasury is reporting dollar and euro bonds as oversubscribed by more than three times. The $1 billion 30-year bond and the 500 million or 500 million euro 12-year instrument on the international market were sold mostly to U.S. and European investors. The successful issuance is a relief for South Africa after S&P cut its credit rating and Fitch put it on a negative watch list last month. That's it for this edition of Global Business. Remember, you can send us your feedback to globalbusinessafrica at cctv.com. You can visit our Facebook page, CCTV Africa. You can also stay in touch with Global Business on Twitter using the handle at CCTV News Africa. I'm G2 Abraham. Thanks for watching.